What's up guys? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Emma if you're new here and I love to talk about all things Peloton cycling and fitness so be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. I post every single Sunday and today's video is definitely going to be something new for me but I thought it could be a fun one. I'm going to be reviewing and talking about Peloton instructor Tunde Onyune's book called Speak. It was released last May in 2022. And it kind of really got kicked off that I wanted to read this book and talk about it because a lot of Peloton instructors are now coming out with books. Like Robin already came out with one, Shut Up and Run, a while ago. And then Toon Day came out with one last year. I believe those are the only two instructors that have books out now. But this year we have Ben Aldis's Raising the Bar, Emma Love Well's Live Learn Love Well, Alex Toussaint's Activate Your Greatness, Cody Rigsby, XOXO Cody, and Robin Arzon has also just come out with a book called Strong Mama, which is a picture book, and it like follows up another picture book she already came out with, Strong Baby. So there's just a lot of books coming out from Peloton instructors. And my first thought is kind of why. And my second thought is, I guess they're all going to be ghostwritten is just my assumption. Like, I'm sorry, but I'm not assuming that these Peloton instructors are writing these books themselves. And they think that people will just like, like buy them and that they'll make enough money back. Like I'd be very curious what the sales are like. Looking at Toon Day's book, which is called Speak, Find Your Voice, Trust Your Gut, and Get From Where You Are to Where You Want to Be. I was honestly surprised because on Goodreads, there's like 6,700 reviews, which is not a ton, but I've definitely read books with way less than that. I feel like 6,700 reviews is pretty good. So maybe there is a market for it, but I do feel like considering like for books that are kind of like the same memoir slash like self-help books that most of these are branded as, like might be a little oversaturated, but we'll see. I'm very interested. You know, Ben Aldis is my absolute fave. So his is definitely on my list. And I feel like at some point I will end up reading the others too, just because like, I'm curious what they have to say. But today's video, I'm going to be focusing on Toon Day's book, see like what we learned about her. I would say that it is branded as like a memoir slash self-help, but definitely leans more towards memoir, in my opinion, with like some cheesy self-help thrown in there. I don't read that much nonfiction. My goal each year is to read 10 nonfiction books. So like this contributed to that, which is great. But out of the nonfiction I do read, I do mostly read memoirs. And I typically read memoirs for people that I don't know anything about because I think that that's like the most interesting and like I want to read people with different perspectives and I actually don't know a lot about Toon Day so I was very interested to like learn more about her. She's definitely not somebody that I take a ton of Peloton classes with just because she mostly does like cycling with some strength and I don't cycle as much anymore. But I was very interested to see like what this book would be like. And the description is from Tunde Onine, the massively popular Peloton instructor, fitness star and founder of Speak comes an empowering, inspiring book about how she transformed grief, setbacks and flaws into growth, self-confidence and triumph. Perfect for fans of Shonda Rhimes, Bren Brown and Glennon Doyle. I don't know who those people are besides Shonda Rhimes. On any given day, thousands of devoted people clip into their bikes and have their lives changed by Tunde Onyine. From her platform in a Peloton studio, she encourages riders with her trademark blend of positivity, empathy, and motivational Tundeisms to put themselves to their limits both on and off the bike. Now fans and readers everywhere can learn about her personal journey and discover how they too can live a life of purpose, on purpose, with Speak, a memoir manifesto guide to life inspired by her immensely popular Instagram live series of the same name. Taking us through each step of the SPEAK acronym, Surrender, Power, Empathy, Authenticity, and Knowledge, Oyune shares the lesson she has learned about lost love, body image, and how she has successfully created an intentional, joyful life for herself, offering an accessible blueprint for anyone looking to make a positive change in their lives. Honestly, the description makes it seem like really self-helpy, which I really did not feel that way, but perhaps people will think differently. Um, it's only 200 140 pages and it has a 4.34 star rating on Goodreads currently, which in my opinion is pretty high. I do think like only people that really like Toon Day probably read this book, so that probably influences the ratings. But I've definitely seen way lower ratings than that. So overall, I feel like if you like Toon Day, like you will probably 
like this book. And the only thing I wanted to note before I kind of got into like the summary and my thoughts because we will be going through all the chapters. There's only 12 because this book is only 240 pages so it really was not long. It did not take me long to read is that this book was ghost written or like written in collaboration with someone. She does acknowledge somebody in the acknowledgments that's like thanks for like taking my thoughts and putting them into words which I thought was interesting. So just something to throw out there. Also the chapters are not in chronological order. She kind of like starts from the beginning but then I feel like it is kind of hard to express all your thoughts in a chronological order if you're like also trying to group these chapters into different categories because she used like the speak acronym for each chapter. She chose a specific word from that acronym. So I feel like when you're structuring it that way, it is hard to do chronological. For the most part, it like wasn't confusing, but I did feel like sometimes it read like a little weird to be jumping back and forth like that. But I think for the most part, it was good. So the book starts off with a good old forward where it is a little more like self-helpy, motivational, kind of talking about like how on Peloton, like, you know, she's helping all of these people, which is definitely true. And then she gets into like what speak is because that's kind of like the theme of the book. So she says speak is about finding my voice, but it's also the movement I've created for others using five key pillars, surrender, power, empathy, authenticity, knowledge. I did go a little crazy highlighting things from this book in my Kindle so I'd remember kind of the flow and she says in order to speak you have to be willing to surrender you have to know your power you have to lead with empathy you have to be authentic and you have to have the knowledge to back it and then we just get right on into chapter one called the perfect dress tagged authenticity in this chapter Tunde talks about growing up and specifically talks about growing up chubby and being a size 18 she like tells a story where she vividly recalls being a bridesmaid and like her cousin or aunt auntie's wedding or something and she needs a size 18 and the store does not carry that size and like she's really upset about this obviously and they're like oh you can wear a different dress but like she didn't want to stand out she wanted to blend in so it actually turns into kind of a nice story where her mom buys two dresses and sews them together so she is in the same dress as everyone else and I think does like highlight how great her mom is even in that story and like that's a reoccurring theme that like her parents and family are like really, really great people throughout the book. But it also is kind of like a turning point for her where she realizes that like she needs to lose weight and like she doesn't want to stand out as being kind of a bigger girl. And she also kind of brings in another part of her story, which is that her parents immigrated from Nigeria to Houston, Texas, which is where she grows up with her and her three brothers. And obviously, like they don't have a ton of money, so they eat a lot of fast food and at the fast food food restaurants like she would always get burgers eat a lot like she would eat as much as her brothers and that's like kind of the reason why she got so big to that point and that like her mom had never like commented on it or like made her feel bad or that like she shouldn't be eating that much so kind of this whole like dress situation it kicked it off for her and she started going to the gym she did comment that she only did cardio because weightlifting was scary and honestly I feel that too day I feel like we all get into working out and I just felt like that was like really relatable and it's cool to see now because she's so strong now and like is literally like two days arms is such a big thing on Peloton so it's nice to know that when she started like she also thought it was intimidating because even now I still think it's a little intimidating so I definitely I thought that that was cool that she included that and then there was you know some more cheesy self-help she says like your mind is your strongest muscle like you got to use it and yeah that was pretty much chapter one then we went into chapter two called a life's purpose and it was tagged empathy and she mostly talks about her love for makeup so before Tunde was a Peloton instructor she was a makeup artist or like worked in the makeup industry so she kind of talks about getting into that how like her mom showed her how to use makeup how like she was obsessed with it she went to college and was working like a bunch of odd jobs and then like finally found her way into working at like a makeup counter in the mall and like doing other people's makeup and she does talk about how like she was really worried about applying to that job and being like what do I have to offer like I don't have any experience and that other people encouraged her to just do it and be like yeah like you have an outgoing personality like you have other skills that you can get your foot in the door here and yeah that worked out and soon she was making like enough money from the makeup counter that she could quit her other jobs and then there's kind of like 
Another parallel happening, she talks about her two friends, Christy and Kim, who are sisters and who are basically like her best friends growing up. They moved out to LA because one of them was like on American Idol or something. I think it was Kim is the older sister was on American Idol. So like she was kind of like living on the fame life in LA and they like convinced Toon Day to drop out of college come to LA and like be a makeup artist there, which was definitely something that Toon Day like stressed she was nervous about, but like felt like she wasn't really getting anywhere in college and that like this was the right thing to do. So she quit college and went to LA. They found like some position for her, but it fell through that she was gonna like be someone like sort of famous makeup artist. But then once it fell through, she was kind of like floundering for a bit. But then she found like another comparable position and it was fine. She does talk about how like moving to LA was kind of the first big move because she went to college in Houston as well. So she was like in Houston her whole life. And then like moving to LA was obviously a very big move, but at least she was with her friends. Then we go into chapter three called Left Foot, Right Foot, and it's tagged Power. And this was a very sad chapter. So her little brother, Tope, died and he was only 19 at the time. I don't know if it said what age she was, but I think she's only like three or four years older. So she's pretty young. And yeah, just how horrible that grief was, how hard it is. Nobody thinks that the youngest brother is going to die, obviously. Obviously. And yeah, that chapter was definitely like very sad and just how like her parents reacted. And she also talked about how like that affected her and like how she was like, what am I doing in LA? Like I should be home in Houston. So definitely a sad chapter. Then we had a little bit of a time jump, went into chapter four called The Blue Light Tagged Surrender. And it was seven years after Tope died. Tunde was still a makeup artist, but she was pretty miserable at the time. I think like up until that point, she had really been climbing the ladder thinking like, oh, I'll be happy at the next level. And now she was like at like the highest level, like she was doing a great job career wise, but she just like wasn't really happy, like didn't really know why she was in LA and was just like very miserable. And then she was on a work trip in New York and the hotel gym was like really sad so she went to a cycling class for the first time and she absolutely loved it it's interesting because she talks about at the beginning when she went like everybody's in cute like matching lululemon sets and everybody is so like thin and white and pretty and like everybody knows each other and they're all super clicky and that she almost left because of that that she's like i don't fit in here but then once she like took the class and clipped in she was like oh my gosh this is like the best thing in my life and it was kind of interesting because she's like oh like when I left that class I thought to myself like this is what I'm meant to do and I'm supposed to be like a teacher on the largest platform for cycling which I thought was kind of odd like a weird way of like thinking and like do you really think that after the first time you leave a cycling class and like did Peloton even exist then like largest platform for cycling seems really weird so I feel like that could have been like maybe a little exaggerated for the book but who knows but then here is where things get like a little bit sketchy for me I feel like we don't have all the details because I would be really curious about like how things actually went down but essentially she comes back from New York comes to LA, starts taking classes, cycling classes at a place called Sweatshop, which is just like a cycling boutique. She really likes it, comments like how diverse it is compared to the New York class and eventually becomes a instructor there part-time. Like they don't really have full-time gigs. So she's still working her makeup job, but she's doing it part-time and like really loves it. And then she says seven months after she starts working this part-time job at this one cycling boutique, she gets a message from Cody Rigsby asking her to audition for Peloton. And she says at the time she didn't know who Cody Rigsby was, but she knew like what Peloton was and knew that this was her dream, which I just don't know. Like, how did he find her? Did he take a class at Sweatshop? Like this whole thing was very weird to me. Did she apply for it? Like none of that is specified. And then she talks about how she goes to the studio auditions. They basically just have like, a fake class. There's no studio audience, even though this is like before the pandemic started, but it's just like an audition. So she talks about how that's hard because like you don't get a reaction from anybody. And then she says at the end that Ali Love, who she conveniently knows from being a makeup artist, I don't know if she was Ali's makeup artist or what at some point, like tells her that Peloton sometimes doesn't take people on like the first audition, but a lot of people get in like 
after multiple auditions. And I'm just like, how do you know Ali Love? Like, did she help you get this interview? I don't think that it's a bad thing that she used connections if she did. I would just be curious because I feel like it's really glossed over like how she got into Peloton. Like, I don't believe that Cody just randomly found her. I think that would be like way too hard. So she gets rejected from Peloton the first time. Obviously, she's devastated. Then we go into chapter five called A Starting Point, Tagged Power. And Toon Day's like really sad and her best friend is just like, yeah, keep trying to like, you know, get a full-time job at this sweatshop place that you're teaching at. And like she talks to the instructor named Mimi and they are like working something out like it's possible that it could happen in the future. And then in this chapter, she also takes some time to talk about how like her dad was so selfless and like worked all these jobs growing up and he actually was going back to school for a little bit. But then his sister asked if he could take like her sons and have them live with him in Houston. So he had to like drop out of college to pay for that, which was a very nice story. I felt like it was a little weird to put it together with like her not getting into Peloton and being sad. But I guess the connection is that kind of her dad never gave up and like Toon Day should not give up either. Then we went into chapter six called Second Chances Tagged Authenticity and she gets a, another callback from Peloton because she says that since then they don't really give like years how many years have gone by but she says since then she has been a face of a well-known fitness apparel brand which is like how? Like what? I'm assuming this is Nike but she gives literally no details about that. Signed on to another potential reality show because she was like going to be in one earlier as well. Basically, like Kim and Christy are always pitching reality shows and they're like always looping Toon Day into them, which obviously shows like she has more connections than she's letting on or like talks about because like I'm not out here pitching reality shows, but it would be interesting to like hear more about that. But like we never do. And that, yeah, she just like has a lot going on. She also mentioned she knows Olivia Amato now through mutual friends, which again, would love to have more details. Like how is she meeting all these Peloton instructors? So she went there, did the audition, like wasn't as confident the first time she did it. She was super confident. This time she was like less confident, but then afterwards she had like a bunch of interviews which I don't believe happened the first time and the interviews all seem to be like personality interviews which like kind of makes sense. I feel like Peloton's aim for a lot of their instructors is like performer first, instructor second. There are some that that's flipped but a lot of them are more like can I see myself being friends with you? She mentioned specifically that she talks about like Tex-Mex in one of her interviews. So you can see that it's like very light and fun. And this time she does get the job, which leads us to chapter seven called A New York Moment Tagged Knowledge, which is kind of more self-help for a little bit. Talks about like setting a standard for yourself versus setting a goal, which I actually kind of like. So she's basically like, yeah, if you set a standard that like you're going to run every day, that's something that you can meet no matter what, right? Like you can run every day. I don't know if running every day is a good example, but like doing something every day or every other day, whatever, versus a goal that's like, I'm going to run a mile in seven minutes or something like that, where even if you do set the standard and meet that standard every day, like you might never hit some like random fitness goal, which I appreciated because I've definitely tried to set goals in the past and like haven't been able to hit them and then get demotivated. So I thought that that was like a cool thing to bring up. I feel like the self-help is like kind of like weirdly sprinkled in, but that was at the beginning of the chapter. Then she talks about telling Mimi, which is like the sweatshop owner, about how she's like leaving to go to Peloton. She quits her makeup job, comes to New York, definitely feels like lonely and that this is just like a really big adjustment and I guess like when she moved to LA obviously that was also a big adjustment but she kind of had like her two best friends there but in New York like she was alone and she talks about like crying in Trader Joe's because all of the aisles are arranged differently and like yeah it just seems like she was very overwhelmed and then she started working at Peloton and was super surprised that people liked her arms because she said growing up she was always super insecure about like how big they were and then she came into Peloton and everybody's like, oh my gosh, I want Toon Day's arms, which I thought was really cool. And it was like a nice, like happy pick me up moment that even if you don't like something about yourself, like 
other people definitely can. And like, you are always your worst critic. She also talks about Peloton employee development, which honestly, like I'm mostly interested for the Peloton stuff. So I would have loved if she went more in depth in this, but it does make sense. Like Peloton wants their instructors to essentially be celebrities. Like it's very clear that they always have tried to do that. And they set her up to interview a rapper and actor called Common at a Black History Month at Brooklyn Museum. And just like, she talks about preparing for it. And like, even though she's never done something like this before, she like, had past skills that like helped her prepare for it and like she did a really good job but I would have loved to hear more about this Peloton employee development unfortunately that's the only time it comes up then we go into chapter eight called the mirror tagged empathy and this chapter I felt like was kind of weird she talks a lot about like relationships and like reflects on her relationships basically she was dating this guy named Brian who like low-key sucked and just didn't do anything but she dated him for like a super long time because she was dating him when her dad died. I do think it was brought up her dad died before this, but then there's a chapter after this that like dives deeper into it. So I'll like talk more about it when we get there. But yeah, just how like she wanted to keep dating him because like that's who her dad knew was the last person that she was dating. But then like she finally broke up with him because he was like not bringing anything to the relationship. And then she talks about volunteering with a support group for young women. And this was like, before she was a Peloton instructor. So we're kind of going back in the past and just like how she brought them makeup, showed them how to do makeup and like was just there for them, um, which was like heartwarming stories. And then she also talks about one of her friends like abusive relationship and basically like helping her friend get out of it. So kind of like a random chapter, I feel like, especially because it's like squished in between Peloton chapters, but they were all interesting stories. I just like didn't know exactly if that was like the best place to put that chapter. Then we're back at Peloton for chapter nine called Speak Up, Tagged Authenticity. And this chapter was specifically about George Floyd's murder on May 25th, 2020, and kind of her response to it afterwards. So she also talks about like her experience with racism, which I thought was personally like very interesting. And I actually would have loved if this chapter was longer. I thought this was probably my favorite chapter in the book. So like she talks about when she was younger, how like she had a teacher that she loved and the teacher was in a wheelchair and like would always let the kids push the teacher around in. And Tunde always wanted to do that. And the teacher would always like say no to Tunde and only Tunde. And like at the time she didn't realize because she was like a young girl until like much later that it was racism. And that was kind of like her first like experience with racism which I thought was really interesting she also talked about like police officer talks that her parents would mostly give her brothers but also like let her know and like her experience with the police that they like stopped her and her brother one day and like thought that they were doing drugs and like smoking pot and like searched their car and that it was just like really embarrassing and it was really interesting to like hear about it and read about it and yeah I would have loved to like even learn more but I was glad with like what she was willing to share she also talked about when coming to Peloton that she didn't want to seem like too black which I thought was interesting I like never had thought about she scrubbed her Instagram of all like BLM stuff she also talked about how she didn't wear braids for like the first six months I think at Peloton like she really did not want to seem too black and like scare people off from taking her classes but then when the George Floyd murder happened like that was the final straw like she just couldn't stay silent anymore she posted an Instagram story about like how horrible this is and how even if we're uncomfortable like we still have to talk about it because it can literally save lives in the future and that she was like worried that she would lose a ton of followers and she did lose some but then like she obviously gained a lot because for like the first time she's being super authentic with her platform and then she also did a speak up ride on Peloton. I can't remember if it was John Foley or if it was somebody else. I was like a chief content officer asked her to do a solidarity ride for George Floyd and she decided to name it speak up to try to bring in like the largest amount of people as possible like she thought if she named it like BLM or anything related to George Floyd that a lot of people wouldn't take it so speak up was kind of like inviting everybody to come and that's who she wanted to have the dialogue with and this was like a massively popular ride I think there was like 22,000 live riders and it was the second most popular ride on Peloton at the time and then she started her 
Speaker Speak series, which is an interview series on Instagram showcasing voices of Black celebrities dealing with racism, which I actually haven't like seen anything like that. I need to go check out her Instagram because I do think it would be really interesting to like watch and see what they're like. And then we went into chapter 10 called The Chop Tagged Power. And this kind of talks about Tunde's relationships with her hair, specifically braids and how she depended on braids to like feel pretty and that she's treated differently like based on different hairstyles, like if she has braids in or if she doesn't, if it's straight, whatever, which I thought was interesting. And it also talks about having very dark skin even darker skin than her mother and seeing Naomi Campbell for the first time and that was like the first woman that she's like oh my gosh she looks just like me and like she's so beautiful and then this chapter ends where she shaves her head which I believe her head is still shaved or like very closely shaven today and how she kind of lets go of all these beauty standards that like she held to herself for so long and like how she feels so free now that her head is shaved. Then we go into another sad chapter, chapter 11 called Always There, Tag Knowledge. It talks about her dad and her mom dying. The dad died like pretty suddenly. He always had like bad health and they like knew he was dying, but she was not there like when he died, like she wasn't around. So that was very sudden. And she talks about how like this grief compared to Tope, she had like held it in for her parents' sake, but when her dad died, she just like lost it and it was so sad. And then her mom died pretty quickly afterwards. I believe it was like two years. Her mom had breast cancer when Tunde was little and was in remission, but then she got ovarian cancer, very aggressive and passed away as well. The only good thing about the mom is that she was in hospice care. So Tunde could like actually say goodbye to her, which she said was like, really nice and like good for closure compared to Tope and her dad. And I'm like, wow, like Tunde is only like 35 years old and she's experienced so much loss and grief in her life. These were such sad chapters and like, thankfully I've never had like a immediate family member die. But I do think that like she really portrayed the grief well and yeah, definitely very sad. And then chapter 12 it was called Life Cycles and it essentially talked about the pandemic and how much that was a struggle. And I believe she quotes Jess Sims and Jess Sims is like, well, have you ever been in a pandemic before? Like, basically, these are unprecedented times, like, it's okay. And basically, Tunde talks about how being in New York, she was like, super nervous at the beginning and like, didn't want to go anywhere. And like, really kind of let herself go, like, wasn't working out, wasn't really doing anything, just was super scared. And how like Peloton becoming more and more popular, like really helped her get out of that funk and like get back into it and feel less afraid. And then at the end, which I thought this was like kind of weird, she talks about freezing her eggs for like five pages and is essentially like, I want a family, just not right now, but like I want the possibility of it later, which I totally like think that's fine. I just thought it was like a very weird way to end the book. And then the book was over. It was definitely an interesting book. I would have loved to hear more in depth about like Peloton just because that's what I'm interested in. So if you like want to know the inner workings of Peloton, this book is not it. I wonder if we'll ever get a book like that because I'm sure they sign like some NDAs, but I really don't know. And I also would have loved to read more about her activism and her experience growing up as like, you know, first generation Nigerian living in Houston. I think that would have been interesting. But I also feel like she doesn't tell us everything and that she could publish like another book in the future. Like I still have many, many questions. I wasn't a huge fan of the non-chronological order, but I do think that that's a hard thing to do. And I would have been fine if there was just like no self-help in it at all. Like sometimes it was nice, but I really am reading it because I like Tunde. I guess with the self-help, she's trying to appeal to a broader audience. But like for me, I didn't need it. And it was a little cheesy at times, but one our Peloton instructor is not a little cheesy at times. Overall, I gave it a three out of five stars on my goodreads honestly i'd give the first half like a two and a half star and the second half three and a half to four star i think it got better towards the end and like i don't know if it was build up but it really felt like i was along for the ride the whole time and it was definitely cool like when she got to peloton because obviously that's the part i'm more interested in 
So yeah, overall, I would recommend this book like three out of five stars is pretty good for me. It means I enjoyed reading it. And I never felt like I was like super bored. I definitely have read books in the past where I'm just like falling asleep during it or I'm like constantly putting it down. And this was like a pretty quick read for me. I read it in the span of a couple days, thought it was an interesting book. So overall, I would recommend this book. And I'm definitely interested to see what these other Peloton instructor books are like. So let me know if you read Tunde's book, if you've read Robin's book. I mostly picked to read Tunde's over Robin's book that's already out because Tunde's was in my library. And you know, I do love the library. And let me know if you're going to read any of these other Peloton books that are coming out this year because there is a lot coming out. I am very curious how they'll do and I'm interested to see like if it's going to inspire even more Peloton instructors to write books. Like will every single instructor have a book at some point? Honestly, I feel like it could happen. That is it for this video. I hope you guys are staying safe, having an awesome week, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!